All right, so here's just something worth keeping in mind. Suppose you do the whole business of building a deformation space, not for the inclusion of K into G, but the inclusion of K into G0. I mean, it's a, it's a sub Lie group of G0. And yep, so let me recall that this group G0 is a semi-direct product group of a certain compact group acting on a vector group like that. And so what I'm about to say applies to any K acting on any vector group like that. So in other words, that in the case, K is like UN or something? K is UN or maybe some subgroup of UN, depending on what the what the group is. Yeah. For example, if it's SL2R, it would be SO2, thought of as, in your, from your point of view, thought of as a subgroup of U2. All right, very good. So what? Well, this is a very simple situation in which all of the directions normal, so to speak, to the submanifold. Remember, we're building the deformation to the normal cone of K inside of G. And what you're supposed to G zero, and what you're supposed to do to build this deformation to the normal cone is somehow increasingly stretch. The, the big manifold in the normal directions without doing any stretching at all in the in the submanifold directions, in this case, the K directions. Well, if you stretch a vector space, you just get a vector space. It's probably not very surprising that this whole thing just looks like G0 times R. So the, the family is actually... Uh, constant family. No new groups arise. You don't have to talk about G0, 0, because the normal bundle of a submanifold, as it sits inside, well, this is some normal bundle, some vector bundle. The normal bundle is the vector bundle you started with. So no further simplifications uh, arise. Uh, but the isomorphism is not completely trivial. It's not the identity map If you take um, a vector, so we know that away from zero, the, the various groups in this family are copies of whatever the big group is, which in this case is G0, okay? And, and so we have a whole bunch of copies of G0 already in here and a whole bunch of copies of G0 already in here. But the way these guys get identified under this diffeomorphism is not by the identity map. Uh, instead, some rescaling uh, is involved. Like that. So this map that I've just written down which is defined when T is not zero on a big open subset of G to a big up open subset of the right-hand side, it extends to a diffeomorphism. That's what I'm saying, okay? And it's not completely trivial because there's some rescaling uh, involved. This rescaling, which is to say automorphism of G0, there's one for each T, which isn't zero. In this particular case, it's a group automorphism. And so it gives or leads to a rescaling with the same number of quotation marks. 
of the dual, because if you have a representation of the dual, you can just compose it with this automorphism of G, and then you get another representation of G, G0. All of the Gs that I said should have been G0s, okay? But, at least in some cases, we discussed last time why it is that G0 is the same thing, going back to G now, as G, G0 hat, excuse me, is the same thing as G hat. It's what I was previously calling and what I should continue to call the reduced dual. The, the spectrum of the reduced group C star algebra, those irreducible representations, unitary representations of G, which are somehow related to the, the regular representation on L2 of G, weakly contained in, as the C star people say. This isomorphism is a little tricky and complicated. Remember, we broke up G the reduced dual into, uh, I don't know, strata pieces, which were locally closed subsets. And, and each of those separately was, was made uh, in, in bijection with a piece over here. Uh, it happens that those individual pieces get uh, rescaled into themselves by these rescalings. That is just a feature of this particular uh, bijection. Um, but let's not worry about that. Uh, we, we can certainly see, say rather, that this thing in, in some similar uh, sense gets rescaled. I just mean there's some family of automorphisms of this set. And, and now something uh, rather interesting happens, which is uh, in joint work with me, but uh, it's in uh, Angel Roman's uh, thesis. What the, the interesting thing that happens is that the uh, automorphisms of the reduced C-star algebra, rescalings, if you like, of this C-star algebra. Uh, let's just call them, I don't know, alpha T. But implement these rescalings that we're talking about. Yeah. That's interesting. And using these rescalings, you can sort of Trivial, you can go backwards now. Da, 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 da. You can sort of trivialize, well, not the bundle of groups uh, GT or the family of groups GT, because those groups are not all the same, um, but the family of C star algebras and only sort of uh, trivialize uh, in, in the following way. you can build an inclusion oops, of the C-star algebra of G0. It's not the case that G0 is isomorphic to G. It's also not the case that the C-star algebra of G0 is isomorphic to the C-star algebra of G. Because these dual spaces that we've been discussing are, although they're in bijection to one another, they're not homeomorphic. Nevertheless, there's a a way of embedding the C star algebra of G0 into the C star algebra of G. And it's characterized uh, 
in, in a very nice way, if you want to apply uh, alpha to a function f0, which is a function on g0, uh, what you should do is look at the functions ft. So what's going on here is that f is a, a function on the entire deformation space. And there's a little lie I'm telling having to do with how measures, but I'm just going to ignore it. Uh, ba, 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 ba. You could take a function on this space, perhaps it extends the function f0. Of course, then it'll have a whole bunch of other slices, so to speak, ft, which is a function on gt, which is a subgroup of g, a subspace of g. And we can do something which I'll describe in just a moment. Yeah. So this sort of badly, it doesn't have nice space of G or GTL. It's like that Yeah, so now, thank you very much. The top part was just for inspiration. This is the deformation space. For K as it sits inside of G. So thank you, I switched. Uh, this board was a, a preamble. This board is a transition. Uh, and now, uh, well, and then a theorem, which I'm sort of continuing over here. Okay. And, and what you're supposed to do is take uh, ft and rescale by alpha t like that, and then just take the limit as t goes to zero. And this will work either for alpha t or alpha one over t. And so let's define alpha t appropriately so it works. I, did, I was sufficiently vague over that, that I cannot be wrong. Okay, that's rather nice. And what that says, this formula says that the, the continuous field, I have a proper word for that, where's my favorite eraser here? Just, well, there is this thing too. Was this here all along? Eh? Ah, so this is what you're supposed to do with that, I guess. It's got like a ball joint. No, that's not good. Oh, well. Okay. But this one is even, even bigger. I think after a certain point, there are diminishing returns. If the eraser is too big, it loses that nimbleness, you know. It's like driving a Bentley instead of a Mini. You can get yourself into trouble driving a Bentley. Might have made it, yeah. Might have gone all the way over, right over Niagara Falls. Anyway, uh, so the the continuous field, that's what I was trying to do, was it raise the word family. associated to this big G, which is the deformation space for K in G, not, not K in G0. That's a very simple structure. Of, it's what, what you might call a mapping cone field. Is a, in fact, the mapping cone field associated. to this embedding. What, what do I mean by this last thing, a mapping cold field? Well, suppose I have a sister algebra A0 and, a, and an inclusion of A0 into another sister algebra A. Then I can build a continuous field in the following way. It's going to be a continuous field over the real line. And all of the fib fibers, a t, uh, are just going to be a, except when t is equal to zero. And then, of course, it'll be a zero. And uh, when, what are going to be the continuous sections? Well, they're going to be arbitrary continuous sections uh, from um, the non-zero reals, arbitrary continuous functions from the non-zero reals into the, into the big algebra a, with the property that as t goes to zero, ah, together with a value at, uh, in A0, it has to be a section which is defined everywhere. And then the, the matching condition for the value of the section at A0, at zero, with the value everywhere else, is that the, the family inside of A 
should limit to the given point of A0. Remember, A0 is embedded inside of A. If you have a C star algebra, I could have said it in a better way. I'll try and say it again. If you have a C star algebra and you have a subalgebra A0 of that C star algebra A, you can define the continuous sections to be all of those continuous functions from the real line into A, which at zero lie inside of A0. That would have done the job better. And we'll call that thing the mapping cone. And that's all this guy is. So this particular of continuous field of C star algebras becomes trivial from the point of view of uh, this inclusion. Once you have this conclusion, the whole continuous field, the whole deformation to the normal cone, the notion of a pseudo differential operator, I don't know what, it all somehow ought to become trivial. Uh, the field certainly becomes not exactly um, trivial in the sense of very easy, not a constant field. The field becomes easy to describe. Hopefully everything else becomes easy to describe as well. Okay, this was just a little, uh, we were wait, wasting time uh, waiting for Echo to arrive, but here, here he is. So. Great, welcome. Okay. I think maybe it's readable. Maybe it's uh, actually readable. I tried to make an effort to write enough down that you could follow. The takeaway is that this business of the Mackey bijection that we were describing, discussing last time, if you package it into the invention of this family of rescaling automorphisms, alpha T, these guys here, which have the effect of making a rescaling of the dual, which corresponds to the natural rescaling of G0. Uh, the takeaway is that this um, final family of objects, these automorphisms of C star of G, somehow tell you everything about the deformation to the normal cone. Uh, everything is packaged into that one parameter family. It's another way of understanding what is the one parameter family, what is, what is the continuous field, which to a certain extent is the same thing as understanding what is the deformation space as a family of groups. It's a little bit mysterious to think of it that way. It's, it's less geometric, isn't it? One parameter family of automorphisms of a C star algebra. But it's interesting to think that maybe that you could make something of that. Start with this one parameter family, search for it before you search for the Mackey bijection, for, for instance. Ah, um, well, it exists in the norm topology. Alpha T of FT is an element of C star of GT, but all of the C star of GTs are the same. That's the little lie I was telling you because they're not quite the same unless you do this sensible thing for groups, which is not, in my opinion, the sensible thing for manifolds, which is to use densities. Uh, and then they would re really all be the same. There's a little issue of densities versus measures, uh, which causes you to pause a moment before you identify one C star of GT with another C star of GT. Modulo that, all I'm saying here is, uh, in this limit is take the norm limit. I'm asserting the norm limit exists and it defines alpha. That's how you actually build alpha. And you get this mysterious inclusion of two group C star algebras for which the groups don't include at all one into another. They're quite different. So the only bit of G0 that fits inside of G is K. Is, is there a way that I can understand it in terms of like So you have this field and like, is there a set, like, is there like a notion of automorphisms of a field and then somehow like, yeah, you can make, extend it? Yeah, you can make various sort of definitions, but I, I find it very hard to understand what's going on in Angel's theorem and this construction from a purely geometric point of view. And part of the problem is that we're talking about C star of G, not the function space of G, T. Uh, so the relevant spaces that we're gluing together into some sort of family of spaces are the duals of these uh, groups, not the groups themselves. You would like to, I don't think this is right, but you could sort of imagine taking, I don't know, the dual of G, that's a closed subset of the dual of G0, or and therefore a closed subset of the dual of G somehow. You, you could imagine doing some deformation to the normal cone construction 
is those spaces which are not quite real spaces they're some sort of non-commutative spaces that's kind of what's going on but I, I don't know how to make proper sense of anything I just said in other words I offer this to you as a little bit of a mystery this is some non-commutative um, construction that is not easy to understand in purely geometric terms at least it's not easy for me to understand it purely geometric terms all right good so gosh we spent way more time on that than i wanted um yeah i, I suppose i'm telling you all of this i mean apart from killing time so that i could, could get here I, I'm, I'm telling you all of this because now we're going to do something else with uh, um, the family of groups uh, G, T, if you like. We're going to do something else with this deformation space, big G. And it's all going to be a little strange what we're doing. And maybe these automorphisms will make it less strange or maybe no more strange than the automorphisms themselves. Maybe the real mystery is this family of automorphisms. I guess that's what I'm saying. So, yeah, go ahead. Do we already know the maximum flight correspondence of something? I'm assuming that the theorem, which I sketched last time, is a true theorem. Yeah. Which, which was the theorem? The theorem says that if if you took... The continuous field of things of Merida equivalent? Yeah, so the field of C-star algebras that we're talking about up here to my, my left, this field is assembled in a complicated way, at the moment only understandable using representation theory, it's assembled in a complicated way from constant fields. That's what I'm talking about. That leads to a, a, some, a, a simpler sort of statement, which is what I started with uh, up here, right here, this set theoretic bijection. So yeah, in principle. in principle, yeah. Everything uh, that we discussed, uh, everything of real substance that we discussed last time, and everything we're going to, of real substance that we're going to discuss today, that's not quite true. Many of the things of real substance that we'll discuss today require in the background some effort in the world of representation theory, which I have not expended. But I mean, in front, I have in real life, I've paid my dues, but but I'm not, I did not expend that effort in front of you. What is the vacuum bijection? It's a bijection. It's this. It's that. This thing is what is called the Mackey bijection. It's, well, at least it's a bijection. It's sort of arguable what it has to do with George Mackey, but, but it's certainly a bijection. Mackey is certainly the inspiration for the construction of this bijection. I guess that's that's a definitely true statement. But this is not the bijection that Mackey had in mind um, when he wrote an inspiring paper a long time ago. Does that help? Yeah, at least I know. <laughs> okay, good. I want to tell you something which to a certain extent applies to all groups, but uh, it's particularly decisive in the world of real rank one, real reductive groups, I'll just say real rank one groups. And for these groups, it's possible to be a bit more explicit about what the representation theory is. Well, you're waiting for some terrible thing to happen. I don't know. It looks like you're fascinated, like someone is fascinated in a car crash or something no yeah yeah all right let's see what happens um i'm going to tell you what a real rank one group uh is so we it's one of our one of our real reductive groups so we'll start off in this way it's closed under the transpose operation, which means that the entire Lie algebra of G breaks up into a K plus a P like that. And now some more letters. Representation theory is famous uh, 
for using all parts of the polar bear, just like up in the north, they, you know, they use the claws for something and the fur for something else. We use all, they, the representation theorists, use all letters. Every letter is used for something. Uh, in fact, many letters are used for many things, which <laughs> many letters yeah, are used again and again and again, which is a nuisance. Anyway, this is a maximal abelian subspace. P. P is not a Lie algebra. P is a bunch of matrices. Um, but you can ask for a vector subspace of P in which all of the matrices, remember they're all um, self-adjoint matrices, uh, a bunch of matrices all mutually commute. And when you've found one, you, you call it uh, A. And, and this thing, it's, uh, it's not such a bad object. Really, this thing is known to be unique up to K conjugacy. more or less in the same way that the maximal torus of a compact league group is known to be unique. Okay, so you fix one. And, and the real rank of, of G is just the dimension of A. So that's what we're talking about. This, this vector space is one dimensional. And if you take uh, SL2R or SL2C, or some f fancier groups like uh, SON1, these groups that the physicists study, or SU, N1. I don't know if anyone studies those for any particular physical reason, or SP, N1, the symplectic version. These are all examples of real rank one groups. So there's a bunch of them. And there's one of one exceptional group, also real life one. And uh, I want to particularly um, focus uh, on those because uh, there's a very simple statement which tells you what is the representation theory of these. Let's go to the next board. The group can be broken up into pieces. This works in any real rank, and it involves what's called the Iwasawa decomposition. And it says that the entire group G as a manifold is the direct product of K times A. What is big A? Well, it's the Lie algebra associated to little a. It's the exponential of little a. So that's a certain closed subgroup. Uh, and then times another subgroup N. So this works uh, in general, but in real rank one, it's possible, pretty easy to say uh, what N is. It's just the elements of the group. It's a very nice sort of dynamical uh, way of thinking about this. It's just the elements of the group which gets shrunk when you conjugate by things in A. What am I calling it? G. So if you have an element of A, any element which is not zero, Then this recipe defines a subgroup. It's easy to see. It's a certain closed subgroup of G. And that closed subgroup always has the property that you can fit it into this KAN picture. That's some closed connected subgroup, nilpotent subgroup, and G is always KAN. Okay. We're almost there, almost completely dealt with the polar bear, just a few grotty bits from the inside to discuss. But yeah. Yes. So the word is abelian. So it's a collection of matrices inside of P, oh. and they all commute with each other in the usual sense of matrices. 
and yeah, it's maximal with respect to being a collection of commuting matrices that automatically makes it a vector subspace, and that's what we're talking about. Okay. So you can do a little experiment uh, for SL to R. How many how many different matrices are there in P? Well, there are two. It's a two-dimensional space. There's two genuinely different matrices. Uh, bases will have two elements in it. Maybe that's a better way of saying it. And they don't commute with each other, no matter which basis you choose. So the maximal dimension is going to be one of a commutative subspace. Yes. This, this thing defined in this way is a group that's an exercise based on this definition. A is a group because it's the exponential of this commuting family of matrices. And if A stands for abelian, and yeah, if you take the product of two commuting exponentials, that is to say x of x1 times x of x2, where x1 and x2 commute, then that's x of x1 plus x2. The usual law applies when the matrices commute. So A is a group. It's a one-dimensional subgroup. Yeah, not a very interesting. Maybe yeah, good point. So first of all, in general, let me just put it on the board. I this means the the exponential of a. So as Eckhart says, let's just do do an example. So k is SO two according to our definition of k. Uh, you can a is not unique. You have to choose a the that choice doesn't really matter much, but you have to choose one. Uh, and a good one uh, to choose is just all of the diagonal matrices like this. These are the exponentials of all of the diagonal traceless matrices. This one, okay. It's, it's not a copy of the circle, it's a copy of the real line. Well, that's what you meant. Yeah. Well, I, I was thinking the one dimensional submanifold. Which we're not, but if, if we were, then yeah, it's always a, a copy of a product of copies of R yeah. as, a, as a Lie group. So Rn is a Lie group. And N, well, there are two choices for N because you, there are two different ways you could choose a non zero element inside of A. You could choose. Uh, a basis element or minus the basis element, and clearly that's going to affect what happens here. But you can choose one of the basis elements. You can choose the x correctly so that the n subgroup looks like this. And they all, this is basically how it always looks. And if you chose made the other choice, the n subgroup would be the lower triangular matrices, not the upper triangular matrices. There's always a finite number of choices, some combinatorial finite number of choices uh, for what n is going to look like. Yeah, ah, for rank one, just two choices. Yeah. So, yeah, in real rank one, you can actually say what n is, but in general, with your n states, that there exists an n with only much power. So, what you have to do in general is is, is the following thing. You, you need to choose x generically. If you choose x uh, non-generically, you'll get an interesting subgroup, which is also called n in representation theory. But it's not the n which appears in this famous Iwasawa decomposition. It's related to so-called some other so-called parabolic subgroup. So this is correct for a generic choice of x. Roughly speaking, just because we're dealing with some self-adjoint matrices which commute with one another. We have some commuting family of matrices. They can all be simultaneously diagonalized. And roughly speaking, generic means all of the eigenvalues are different, roughly speaking. So if you choose a generic uh, X, which for which there are no identities among eigenvalues other than those imposed by the ambient group G, then so there are as many independent eigenvalues as, as could that could possibly be, then that X will do the job here. SL3, there should be, uh, you're not allowed to choose the three eigenvalues independently. They have to add up to zero, but you can certainly make them all different. And if they are all different, then you're in business here. Okay. That's what we're talking about. Uh, yeah, there's a little bit of polar bear still uh, to eat. It's 
is going way slower. Well, we'll see. Um, Centralizer of A. Okay. So this is the subgroup of K consisting of all elements in K which commute with all elements in A. So everything in M commutes with everything uh, in A. Now you can build this thing, M, A, N, while we're at it. Continuing the SL2R example. For the same choices that you see up there, M is just the, in this case, it's a tiny group. It's a finite group of just two elements. And this P subgroup is the group of all upper triangular matrices inside of SL2R. Like that. And we're done with all of these crazy letters. No more crazy letters. Okay. This group MA, it's the group of diagonal matrices in this example. Of course, it's a subgroup of this group P, but it's also a quotient of this group P because the N part is a normal subgroup of P. You can easily satisfy yourself using the definition of N, which I wrote above, uh, that if you have something in MA, it normalizes N. The condition defining N is invariant under conjugation by anything in M and also anything in A. Not surprising because of commutativity. Okay, so this guy here, MA, is a quotient. It's a group because M and A commute. So we've seen this, or we haven't seen this yet. Uh, each uh, representation of MA, unitary representation of MA, uh, is uh, therefore a representation of P just by composing with the quotient map. Okay. And we can induce. This is a heavy dose of representation theory. That's the bad news. The good news is it's just about done. And then there's a really interesting theorem. Um, what are we going to induce? Well, we're going to take a, an irreducible representation of M and an irreducible representation of A. A is an abelian group. So all of its irreducible representations are one dimensional. And they all come from exponentiating an element in the dual vector space of A, Rome, the fractor A. So sigma here is an irreducible representation of M. And nu is an element of A star, the dual vector space. And lambda is here. Yeah. Or I nu. I guess David Vogan will put an I then. So let's follow him. Okay. And, in, and, and induction is a certain species of induction. Induction is the flip side of restriction, somehow adjoint to restriction. That's how you're supposed to think of induction. And so it's a way of constructing representations, in this case, unitary representations, because there's a version of induction called unitary induction, and that's what I'm really talking about. And that's it. And so we have here unitary representations of G. And what happens is they're all irreducible, pretty much. Certainly they're irreducible if uh, nu is not zero. Ah. That's a statement which is true in real rank one.
they're always unitary representations. If you happen to be in real rank, they're always almost all irreducible. And in in the world of real rank one, almost all just means that this new should be non-zero. And when they're irreducible, or when you're studying an irreducible sum and they're actually in the reduced to. You're probably exhausted from, you know, you, this tiring journey through remote parts of the Roman alphabet. <laughs> Um, but the good news is we've we've now emerged from 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 the woods, and so here's a, a beautiful theorem of Harish Chandra and Langlands. Why might you possibly be interested in such an involved and crazy construction of representations as the one I just sketched to you? You might think there's a million things a person could do to build representations, irreducible representations of, of a group G. Well, that turns out not to be the case. Uh, you now see before you, if you combine what you see with what we said uh, yesterday, you now see before you all of the irreducible representations in the tempered jewel of, of a group G. So th there's a general version of this result in any uh, real rank, but I'll state it in, in real rank one because I don't have to stress myself too much or yourselves too much. So in the world of real rank one, for these groups that were in that list, which is somewhere, this one down here, if you have an irreducible unitary representation of G, which is in the reduced dual, well, there are two possibilities. One is that it's one of these uh, discrete series representations that we discussed last time. And the other is that it's an irreducible constituent, it's an irreducible sub-representation of one of these things. that we just constructed. Maybe we could just continue, maybe just here somewhere. Yeah, most of these representations are irreducible, especially in real rank one. The only issue is when nu is equal to zero. When nu is zero, there are only two possibilities. Uh, one is that the representation is still irreducible. That can happen. And the other possibility is that it breaks up into two irreducible bits. And a constituent means either one of those two irreducible bits or the entire, in the other cases, entire irreducible pi sigma i nu. It, oh, this is not part of the Langlands classification. This this is a relatively easy uh, result. That's although it uses the same techniques that you see in the Langlands classification. If you happen to know what that is, namely asymptotics of matrix coefficients, this is built using that same technology of matrix coefficients, analyzing the asymptotics of matrix coefficients. And speaking of asymptotics, the way in which this N is defined in some, according to some asymptotic formula is very relevant to, to the proof. It's really the definition of N which makes this theorem over here true. Now it doesn't seem so bad. It, it seems like you, you're led to this definition by the wish to create a theorem like this. That's not what happened historically, but it could have happened that way. 
if Langlands had been in charge from the beginning, it probably would have happened that way, but he wasn't. Okay, Dan, just just complain. I know you're. Not you know. <laughs> just trying to understand. I, I mean, I was just going to make a comment about how you can kind of see like you have a new not equal to zero, mm -hmm. and then you also have this x not equal to zero above, so you can kind of see it. Like, Maybe they're mm. That definitely is, I mean, those are not totally unrelated issues. Um, yeah, those are not totally unrelated clauses or whatever. On the other hand, it's not it's a bit of a journey to yeah. prove this. It's not a it's not a steep and difficult journey, but it's still a bit of a journey to prove this. But it's kind of beautiful. Now you know what the, the representations of, of these groups are, at least these real rank one groups. And it's not hard to tell you the statement for a general group, but but I won't. It's just some, there's a variation on this. We're missing some parts of the story. And it has to do with the fact that this definition uh, of N is, you have to be a little, it, it can lead to many different ends, as I was just saying. And, and somehow all of those ends a part of the story, whereas here I'm only talking about one end. Okay. So in this case, basically what we've done is we'll say we the unitary representation of G, which gets the whole thing. And we've reduced it to understanding string series and uh, representations of M A. It's mostly, yeah, the complicated thing is representations of M. That's some compact group, and it's not, as you can see in this example, it's not necessarily connected. So it can actually be a chore to work out what M is and what its representation theory is. As for the news, they just belong to vector spaces. That's not a terribly difficult part of the story. So it's really the sigmas there, and, and also the sigmas, which are discrete series representations of G. Okay, so I so we have a non-compact group, and we're essentially limiting our representation of it to a compact group. Correct. And it fits fully under the compact group better. Correct. This is definitely progress, because M is, first of all, a smaller group. Uh, it's, K is already a smaller group, and M is a subgroup of K. So it's not a very big group, although it's not always as small as it turned out to be for SL2. And um, so if you like apply this to G equals SL2, mm -hmm. Is it yeah, you know, I think uh, M is a two-element group. How many irreducible representations are there of a two-element group? Well, ask your algebra professor. There are two, and they're both one-dimensional. Then you can you can send the obvious generator minus the identity to minus one or, or one. That's it. So there are two types of so-called principal series. These guys here, one where sigma is the trivial representation and one where sigma isn't. Those are those two lines that I drew on, on Tuesday of representations. And then there are the discrete series. Let's not forget about them. Those are a bit more mysterious. But do we understand the discrete series? Uh, yeah, we do. Um, that's a long story, but yes, we do. We, we understand them in a way which is strongly reminiscent of the vile character formula. That's the good news. The bad news is that, we're, uh, that when Harris Chandra proved this, it turned out to be so difficult that he had a mental breakdown. It almost killed him. So it, it's it's doable, but it's not easy. Even for Harris Chandra, it's not easy. It almost killed Harris Chandra. Yeah. Driving his Bentley completely left the road. Damn. All right, good. Uh, let's keep these guys up. I'm going to have to make a decision about what to tell you because we're ambling along at much less than 100 miles an hour. Second? <laughs> That's right. That's just in the final 10 minutes of the lecture when I'll get panicky that I haven't. <laughs> Uh, but, 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 yeah, right. Now back uh, to Mackie for a moment.
there is this motion group. This is the normal, geometrically, the normal bundle of K inside of the group G. And uh, it's a semi-direct product like I've just uh, drawn. And so K is a quotient of G0. Because the P part in the semi-direct product is the normal subgroup, and K is acting on it, conjugating P into it, itself. So each time you have an irreducible representation of K, you get an irreducible representation of G just by composing by this quotient map, which sends G0 uh, to K. So we could say in that way, G0 uh, includes a copy of K hat. Sorry, G0 hat includes a copy of K hat. But uh, Afgustidis, who's the guy who did the major part of the work here, proved that the Mackey bijection, so this, there is this bijection which is more or less natural. It's a reasonable bijection between G0 hat and, and G hat reduced. The unitary dual of this easy group, supposedly easy group G0, in fact, we wrote down what is the unitary dual of this, and the unit, the tempered or reduced unitary dual of G, which is a little more complicated, but it's coming a bit into focus here, thanks to uh, David Morgan. So uh, K hat sits inside somehow, the reduced dual may be embedded, is embedded by Mackie and Afgustidis and friends into G hat reduced dual. And it turns out that thanks to the way in which the Mackey bijection uh, is, is defined, these are what uh, Alexander calls the tempiric representations, the ones corresponding to points of K hat of G. This is a contraction of tempered, irreducible, real, infinitesimal character representations. And, and now you know why Alexander calls them tempiric. It's a bit of a mouthful. I won't tell you what all of these words mean because it's not terribly uh, important, but uh, I'll, one can translate all of these words into the picture that Langlands is trying to paint here. And I'll just tell you what the story is in the Langlands language. So every discrete series representation satisfies all, all of uh, these uh, words. I should say, by the way, that they, they don't always exist. We drew a picture of the tempered dual of, of SL2C uh, last time, and there weren't any isolated points. So these guys don't have to exist. And then the constituents of all of the bases, bases of the, so the representations you build this way. Oh, I was going to give an example. Let me just come back to that in a moment. Uh, the, the bases of the so-called principal series. So these are the other representations that Langlands speaks of. Uh, and, and by a base representation, I, I mean a representation where the continuous parameter is zero. When the continuous parameter is zero, like I said, the representation need not be irreducible. And so in that situation, all of the individual constituents uh, are considered to be tempiric, are, are tempiric according to the official definition of David Vogan. Okay. So this is what these distinguished representations turn out to be. And uh, Mackey puts them in, in, in bijection with uh, 
with the representations of K. Let me just, because uh, it seems a, a little lo lonely, uh, just leaving this thing, this example here without saying something. If G is SL2R, then the space that you get, the homogeneous space you get by dividing out by P, this subgroup that you see somewhere here, this group of upper triangular matrices, that's a three-dimensional group divided by a two-dimensional subgroup, because remember the determinant condition. So it's a one-dimensional manifold. So what can it be? It's just uh, RP1 with its usual action of um, uh, SL2. Thank you. Uh, and the principal series can be just realized as uh, sections of G equivariant bundles. Over. Just to give make them seem a, a little bit more concrete, concrete. You, you take a suitable equivariant G equivariant vector bundle over RP one. Well, what does suitable mean? A, a G equivariant bundle over a homogeneous space is the same thing as a P equivariant bundle over a point because, yeah, because. And, uh, and the representations that we're talking about here, of course, are exactly these ones. So they should be the unitary uh, on, on this fiber. So, excuse me, sir. Uh, so we are uh, defining a group structure or, I mean, uh, on the manifold. We are defined. No, it's. I'm saying that RP one. It's not a group, but it's a homogeneous space. Okay. It's not a group. P is not a normal subgroup. I'm. Okay. I'm trying to make this construction of of induced representations just seem a little more geometric. I didn't tell you what the induction process was, but now I am going to tell you. It means you take a representation of P, the subgroup. Okay. You build out of that subgroup uh, a, a vector bundle, a G equivariant vector bundle over G mod P, and then you take the sections. Mm. And then there's a little detail about half densities, just to please the French. And, and that's what the induced representations are. So that I just tell you that just to make it seem a little more concrete. Thank you. Okay. Okay, that was just me noticing that I forgot to tell you about the example. All right, very good. Okay, so we're learning a little uh, representation theory. And now let me uh, tell you a beautiful theorem of David Vogan, which you can see is somehow baked in to the Mackie bijection. First of all, if you have a representation of G, then you can break it up, break up the Hilbert space H pi, not, not, not necessarily as a representation of G, it might be an irreducible representation, but you can always break it up when you, in a canonical way, when you restrict to, what's a good letter, maybe tau, restrict to k. This is the isotypical decomposition of h pi as a representation of k. And what you do is, uh, what is h sub pi upper tau? It's just the, uh, union of all of the images of possible ways that you can embed the representation tau into h pi. That union turns out to be a, a little Hilbert space, and that's what we're talking about here. And that, of course, is an orthogonal Dirac sum, an L2 uh, Hilbert space Dirac sum, if you want to get a Hilbert space.
and the, the tau for which this isotypical space puts it could be for a given tau that the space is zero but the tau for which uh, h pi tau is not zero uh, these guys are the k types of pi And that's uh, typically of an infinite set of, of taus. Most of the time, for example, for all of these principal series representations we were just describing, it's a big infinite set of taus. And yeah. And now a line which I alluded to uh, last time. And I'm just going to tell you the official definition just so we have it uh, on the board. We talked about highest weights a little bit last time. Those were the weights of the representation tau, which were extreme in, 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 the, in those diagrams that we were drawing. <clears throat> And you choose one of the, in the drawing diagrams, we were drawing six points according to some combinatorial recipe. The same combinatorial recipe chooses another point for you in the, in the, in the example from last time, a plane, and which is standard fare in representation theory, something called rho. And David says that the way of ordering the representations is not what I explained last time according to inclusion of weight diagrams. Uh, it's this small variation on that where you take the weight and you slightly adjust it this way and you just take the norm. This is a, a point in, in some plane with an inner product and you just, well, it's not necessarily a plane, some Euclidean space with an inner product and you take, a, take the norm. It's a funny definition for lots of reasons and what you should think about when you see this is that we're just talking about the same ordering we discussed last time, the intrinsic ordering on representations by inclusion of weight diagrams. That's not what this is, but it's pretty darn close. And so that's uh, what will, that's what you can think of. Some natural ordering, some representations are bigger than others. Some groups uh, like uh, SO2, the representations are labeled by integers. Well, I'm just asking when is one integer bigger than another? When is the absolute value of one integer big, bigger than another? That's all I'm talking about. All right, good. So here's now David's theorem. Back to these tempiric representations which in the case of real rank one are, are written down here, but, but this theorem is true in, in any rank. It's just easier to think about in, in this case. Each one has a unique minimal K type. It's minimal be because you're just taking this norm here, and it's entirely possible that two different taus could have the same norm according to this formula, in which case, how to judge between them? Well, you can't. But in these tempiric representations, there's a unique k-type which minimizes this quantity. It's kind. If you do this for SL2, what you find is that this uniqueness does indeed hold for these, as it has to, because it's the theorem of David's. But if you nudge away, if you move the continuous parameter away from zero just a little bit, then it fails. It's kind of uh, interesting. It all fits together, but, but only just. And in the other direction, each k-type is the minimal k-type. Yes, so we could just say ah, minimal k-type. And in fact, it has multiplicity one. In a unique. In a unique temporary representation.
Yeah. Yeah, there's a bijection between K types and temperic representations. And the bijection has the property that the temperic representation, including uh, associated to a representation tau of K, includes tau uh, as a minimal K type, and, and it's the only minimal K type, and it has multiplicity one. I think that's a bit representation of Yeah, is minimal K type, in fact, a minimal K type of multiplicity one in some, and indeed a unique temporary representation. Ah, it's the, yeah, the number of, uh, it could be that uh, H pi tau is just uh, isomorphic to a single copy of the representation tau, that's multiplicity one. Could be that h pi tau is isomorphic to a direct sum of two copies of tau, and then it's multiplicity two and so on. Or, I mean, it, yeah, it, all of these multiplicities are finite by this theorem of Harris Chandler that we mentioned last time. It's saying that the temporary greater than one to one correspondence to the original representation. Yep, it's saying that. So there is a bijection, and in fact, the bijection is the, the Mackey bijection. That's not written anywhere here, but but it follows from the way in which the minimal the Mackey bijection is assembled using minimal k types. All right. And so the question I want to ask, question really that David asks is is uh, is was the following is uh, K theory of C star algebras useful here? in understanding or illustrating uh, this theorem in one way or another. Ah, Vogan. There's a certain set of representations that David uh, has identified as being important, namely these tempiric representations, namely these ones here. It's a certain countable set of representations. On the other hand, there is a certain countable set of irreducible representations of K. And, and now you can imagine building a gigantic matrix and uh, in the entries of this matrix, they're indexed by a tempiric representation and an irreducible representation of K. And, and what you put in the IJ entry is the multiplicity with which tau I appears in tempiric representation J. So it's a matrix whose entries are non-negative integers. And if you order the representations of... Um, both G, the temperic representations of G and, and, and the representations of K, I use ordering a little bit loosely here. If you imagine ordering them in your mind's eye, sorry, Jacob, uh, then you'll, you'll have a big matrix. Uh, and just by definition of minimal K-type, the way in which we're ordering the temperic representations by minimal K-type, this matrix will be upper, upper triangular. And then the multiplicity one statement says that this is an upper triangular matrix, matrix with ones down the diagonal. That's what David is saying, okay? But if you have an upper triangular matrix with ones down the diagonal, then it's an invertible matrix. All right, so uh, some invertible, some, some matrix, some upper triangular matrix is invertible and well, uh, that's the sort of thing you could conceivably prove using K-theory because you would get a triangular matrix or at least a matrix with integer entries by, by looking at some isomorphism or some morphism between K-theory groups if those groups were free abelian groups, which they are in this world of, that we're talking about here. The, all of these K-theory of C-star algebra groups, as the K-theory of group C-star algebras, uh, they're all actually free abelian groups. So there's a bunch of interesting matrices floating around. And uh, you might ask, is David Vogan's multiplicity matrix one of them? And that's the question which we're going to try to sort of uh, answer. If you're optimistic and you know, sort of C-star centric, 
like me, you might ask, could you actually use Sister algebras to prove David's theorem? And that's, of course, a much harder question. And the answer is mm, sort of in some special cases, namely these real rank one cases that we're talking about up there. That's where we're going. David Vogan um, has proved a theorem here. It's not possible to tell just from the statement, but this is really in the in the thick of things uh, when it comes to understanding not just the tempered dual, but the, the full admissible dual of G. These tempiric representations play an absolutely fundamental role in the gigantic uh, computer, the deep thought-like computer, um, which answers the question, you know, the great question of life. I have a representation here. Is it unitary or not? And so the computer says, I don't know, I'll have to think about it. And then it then it goes away and it does calculations with these tempiric representations. And it does this and that. And a few years later, it gives you the answer. Right? That's how it works. There is a real, a real such program called Atlas, which does exactly that. There's a command called is unitary. It should be is unitary question mark, but it's just, I think, is unitary. And it will tell you. You have to tell it what the representations are. There's an art to that. But if you can tell it, the name of a certain representation, it will tell you actually in an instant, unless it's a really big group, whether it's unitary or not. And it's all about these tempiric representations. That's what's going on behind the scenes. Some people think that what the program does is it just phones up David Vogan and asks David, but but that's not the party line. The party line is that there's an actual computer program which answers the question and it's organized around these around many things, but, but a big part of the story are these tempiric representations. All right, very good. So, um, and the reason I'm telling you all of this stuff, rabbiting on and on and on about this, is that the answer to this question uh, uh, involves pseudo-differential operators, scalable operators. So it's, uh, you know, we sort of come full circle. There's something poetic to the whole story, and uh, that's, it's what it's all about. It's poetry, isn't it? And that's what we're aiming for in these lectures. Okay. So we've made an adventure into representation theory, and we're pretty much done. We're going to now go back into the world of uh, geometry. Geometry, analysis the world with very few fewer groups in it, uh, group actions, if you like, not representations. Not completely at the end, we'll have to go back and visit Langlands again. So to, to go back to David's question over there, so we'll answer or attempt to answer. By looking at scalable operators, again, remember those? If you were undergraduates, you wouldn't, right? Because you just remember what you need for the next midterm. And this was way back, wasn't it? But here you go, we're back in, in business. So we're going to be working on the symmetric space. And after years of getting confused, uh, I've decided that you should take the collection of, of, of these cosets, the right cosets, so that you should make a homogeneous space on which GX on the right. That just seems to be better. Of course, all equivalent, but that just seems to be better. So that's a certain manifold. It's a symmetric space. It's a very nice manifold. It's just a copy. As a manifold, it's just a copy of Rn. And so we know what these things are. And the, the only and, and when I say scalable operators, remember these operators had built into them a certain continuity assumption and a certain um, proper support assumption. So all of that still stands. We're dealing with properly supported operators just like we were before. And, and now the new thing is that these operators should be G-equivariant. Yeah. 
So maybe this is like a good indicator to ask. Why would I go from that to that? Like, why? What, what's the, the logical lead from the bottom right board now to the bottom left? The way this worked was I was giving some lectures. We have an online community where where we talk about C-star algebras in, in front of representation theorists and, and vice versa. And so I was giving some lectures and about the con Casper price model, exactly what we were talking about last time. And uh, David Vogan said, that's not what I want when I described all of the wonderful properties that C star of G has and the con Casper of isomorphism. He said, what I want is, is some kind of convolution algebra of functions on G, which has the property that the K theory of that convolution algebra of functions naturally contains um, a copy, in fact, naturally is the representation ring of K. I said last time that when you calculate what is the K theory of C star of G, you get something which is very close to the representation ring of K, but it's not the representation ring of K. For example, I didn't really emphasize this, but there's a dimensionality in this whole story and this, this metric space could be odd dimensional. And if it is odd dimensional, then the, the K theory, the one I've been talking about in these lectures is actually just zero. There's also a group called K1 and, and that's the interesting one in that case. And David wouldn't like that at all. He wants all of the interesting K theory always to be in degree zero and it always to be R of K. And, and so, so then I had a back and forth with David about over email in which I suggested a couple of things uh, and he didn't like them. And, and then I said, well, if you don't like those, there's nothing else, you know, abandon hope, it can't be done. And then I thought, well, maybe, hang about, maybe it can be done. And, and th so that's the creation story. And it was a bit hit and miss in other words. We were looking, I was looking for a certain algebra because David Vogan demanded it and I thought it didn't exist and lo and behold, it does exist. Okay. That's, okay. In fact, what's written here is not quite good enough to really feel the deal. You need to study uh, something a little uh, a little fancier, not much uh, fancier. This is a homogeneous space, and we encountered a hom homogeneous space just a moment ago up in the example up there. And over the homogeneous space, there are lots of equivariant vector bundles, and they all come from representations of G. Excuse me, K. And uh, what I want to consider are more fancy operators which look like this. They're hardly, from an analytic point of view, they're, they're not fancier uh, at all. So these E's just mean the vector bundles that you get by taking two unitary representations of, of G and, and forming this induced vector bundle construction. So these are unitary finite dimensional representations. Okay. We certainly want to play with all of the finite dimensional representations of K all at once. That's obvious from the question that we're trying to answer. And so we shall. So and there's no harm in thinking of operators which map sections of one vector bundle to sections of another vector bundle. That's like saying there's no harm in thinking of a matrix of scalable or pseudo-differential operators, which is just a rectangular matrix. If you have any ring, you can form a rectangular matrix whose elements are from that ring. And then by matrix multiplication, you can build a sort of algebra uh, of such matrices over elements in the ring. And that's what we're going to do here. But it, of course, you don't get an associative algebra. What you get is a category. And not, this is not a big deal at all. So much so that I'm going to put it in uh, parentheses. 
So we can look at a category uh, whose objects, not a groupoid. So the objects are finite dimensional for reasons that are going to be relevant later, unitary representations of K. And then morphisms as above are scalable operators. So it's not it's not really a single algebra anymore. It's a whole category, but no big deal. Uh, that's what we're going to study. It's a category, but but people know how to take the K theory of a category just as easily as they know how to take the K theory of a of a C star algebra. Um, and and that's what we're going to do. We're going to take the category that we're discussing here is being discussed here to avoid menacing issues. In algebra, we're going to complete uh, these various morphism spaces to, to make what's called a C star category. That's because if you have a C star category, figuring out what is the K theory of that C star category is particularly simple. Whereas forming the algebraic K theory of any old category, that's, that's a lot messier. So we're going to take this category, we're going to turn it into a so-called C star category. That just means we're going to take some norm completions of these spaces of morphisms. In order to do that, we're going to be working with order zero operators, because those are the ones that extend to bounded Hilbert space operators. And then we'll have a C star category, and then we can take the K theory of that C star category. And we shall see that the K theory of that C star category, okay, it's not quite an algebra, but it's pretty close, uh, is exactly the representation ring of K. And that assertion that I just made is actually, is, I know to be true because I know the Kahn-Kasparov isomorphism to be true. This is an equivalent formulation of the Kahn-Kasparov isomorphism. So it's a non-trivial statement, but it's true. And so there's a, an isomorphism from R of K into this C star category. We'll also build a morphism from the K theory of this C star category to uh, the free abelian group on David Vogan's, these guys, where are they? Temperic representations, which are here. And if we, comp a natural morphism by evaluating pseudo-differential operators on representations, that's some kind of Fourier transform, some very natural morphism. And then when you compose the morphism from R of K to the K theory, with the morphism I just hinted at from K theory, to the free abelian group on temperic representations, you'll get a map from R of K to the free abelian group on temperic representations. Each of those has a natural basis. And so that what you actually have is a gigantic matrix of integers. And that will be a gigantic matrix of integers, which is upper triangular and the ones down the diagonal. It's exactly the matrix that I was talking about before. So just under the surface um, here, or just above the surface, I don't know where it is, just a little bit beyond this definition uh, is a matrix. And, and that matrix, the invertibility of that matrix uh, is a, basically equivalent to, to David's theorem. It's a big part of David's theorem and it's closely related to the kron kasparov isomorphism. And so we're kind of in the right territory to, uh, to provide to David a reasonable answer to this question. That's um, what we'll discuss, not today, there's only three minutes left. That's what we'll discuss on, on Monday. And I wanted to say uh, one more thing. Oh yeah, getting back to real rank one groups that's still on the board there. Uh, we'll, we'll check David's isomorphism using a, a calculation in K-theory of C-star algebras in real rank one. I don't think this is a terribly profound contribution to representation theory, because in this particular case, real rank one is, is, a, is a profound simplification, but it's a start. So we'll see you get a little insight into David's theorem just by doing a calculation in K-theory in real rank one. Um, yeah, so it's an encouraging story. Uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not claiming we're about to put David Vogan out of business. That doesn't appear to be the case, but, but it's an interesting connection that's emerging. Very good. Uh, we shall continue this whole um, adventure after Thanksgiving.